Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Jonathan Geyer here with the Middle East Task Force and the Middle East Channel at ForeignPolicy.com, which is a publication we co-edit with uh, Mark Lynch at GW. Uh, so I just want to welcome you on behalf of my colleagues Daniel Levy and Leila Hilal, who co-direct our task force. We try to bring new perspectives, new ideas to long-standing conflicts, chief among them Israel, Palestine, Israel, Arab issues. So uh, we're really glad you made it out on this rainy morning. We have a really distinguished uh, and smart panel, some new ideas hopefully about Israel-Palestine because we're ripe for new ideas on this issue after the UN. I think all of us know that um, the, United, the United Nations General Assembly uh, convened about two, three weeks ago, uh, Palestine applying for membership at the Security Council. Uh, many criticisms uh, in Washington for not going to the General Assembly, for not getting an easy win. At the moment, the membership is stalled in the in sort of technical committees with experts at the Security Council. Mahmoud Abbas is in Latin America lobbying for, uh, for states on the Security Council to uh, back statehood. So we're at another impasse. Things have been changing, but it looks more the same than ever. So I'm excited to hear what, uh, what our panel has to say about this. So we have um, Yossi Alfer, who is the co-editor of the Bitter Lemons family of publications, which uh, I'm a big fan of. I've been reading Bitter Lemons basically since I've been hooked on this conflict. Uh, he's formerly director of the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University. He's uh, served as an advisor to the Prime Minister's office in Israel, and uh, he's director of political security domain in independent NGO. We also have Rob Malley, who directs the Middle East North Africa program at International Crisis Group, uh, formerly a, a Clinton administration official for Arab-Israeli affairs and served on National Security Council. And uh, I always love his articles in the New York Review of Books, and it's it's been a while since he's written on Israel-Arab issues, so I'm excited for his take today. And we also have uh, Nadia Bilbasi from NBC. She's a senior U.S. correspondent who's, uh, her claim to fame is having interviewed George W. Bush four times, the most of any Arab journalist. Uh, she's, she's been with Al Arabiya for the last eight years. She's re reported extensively from, uh, from Africa, from various uh, conflict zones. And uh, she was recently in New York for the General Assembly. So um, as I say, a lot has been changing, but it looks more the same than ever. Uh, I think the conflict's very ripe for, an, for a new paradigm, a new approach. And uh, Yossi Alfer has argued that the United Nations, uh, the application for, for statehood at the United Nations actually presents a big opportunity to Israel and a new way to manage the conflict, a new paradigm, and uh, an opportunity to see this as a state-to-state -state issue rather than uh, a conflict which obviously we've been grappling with an Oslo paradigm for 20 years of direct negotiations that have gone basically nowhere. So with that, I'll, I'll turn to Yossi for a, a, a presentation of how a new paradigm might look and then we'll, we'll continue taking stock of what has been happening since the General Assembly. Thank you, Jonathan, and good morning, everybody. Uh, a new paradigm. Let me submit to you uh, four propositions. Uh, first, that uh, we're looking at a very difficult year ahead because no matter what happens at the UN, there are not going to be productive negotiations. The, the Obama administration is not going to play any kind of active role in encouraging uh, negotiations. Uh, and uh, we could see, given the surrounding, the atmosphere in the surrounding Arab world, we could see some serious uh, disruptions, violence. Uh, we really uh, cannot predict what's going to happen in the Israeli-Palestinian sphere, but I think it is fair to predict that nothing particularly positive is going to happen. So we're looking at a, at a, at a problematic and a dangerous year. Secondly, 18, you said 20 years, I give it 18 for Oslo. Uh, 18 years after the Oslo process began, and in particular, uh, having experienced two opportunities at the summit in uh, July 2000, Camp David, and in the course of 2008, the uh, Olmert uh, Abu Mazen negotiations, 
two opportunities at the summit to deal seriously with the final status issues. Uh, it's time to reassess whether uh, uh, there is any point in pursuing the same Oslo paradigm that we've become accustomed to. I wouldn't argue that Oslo has done nothing. Oslo has created the, uh, the autonomous authority. Uh, the Oslo interim steps got us somewhere. But uh, it's my sense that on the Palestinian side, there is exactly this kind of reassessment. Uh, and the sense that uh, Oslo has ground to a halt and that after two attempts to deal with the, uh, the Oslo menu for final status issues, uh, we need to take another look. And I would submit, and this is my, my third insight, that the, uh, deci the Palestinian decision to go to the UN represents exactly such an attempt to change the paradigm of the way the conflict is dealt with, uh, and in particular to change the focus from Israel sitting down with the Palestine Liberation Organization, which under Oslo is its is its partner and which represents not just the Palestinian Authority but the Palestinian diaspora as well, uh, to change it to a state-to-state -state model uh, of negotiations. And finally, I would submit that this move by uh, Abu Mazen constitutes, uh, if, if left as is, could indeed have some very problematic consequences for Palestinians, for Israelis, for the conflict. But it offers us an opportunity, and by us I mean in particular Israel and the United States, uh, to leverage this initiative into a kind of a win-win proposition a, for the two sides based on state-to-state -state negotiations. Let me go back now and talk for a minute about uh, why we are at a, a, an impasse a, a, with Oslo. First of all, uh, a, because Israel is negotiating with the Palestine Liberation Organization, it is negotiating with a group which to a large extent represents the Palestinian diaspora and uh, places huge emphasis on the issue of right of return and, and, and of return. Uh, secondly, in those two opportunities at the summit, to engage all of the final status issues. What we have seen is that the 1967 issues, that is to say borders, Palestinian capital, uh, and security, have proven far more negotiable than the pre-67 issues, what I would call the narrative issues. The, the holy places, which in some ways from an Israeli standpoint is a 3,000 year old issue, uh, and the refugee issue, which is a 1948 issue. You can look at where the parties uh, have ended up uh, when Abu Mazen and Olmert parted in September 2008. You can see a bridgeable gap on, this, on the territorial issue and on the security issue and on the, the geographic Jerusalem issue. But it was Abu Mazen who walked away from those talks and said, outlined what Olmert offered him, which from the Israeli standpoint was the most far-reaching offer, I believe, Palestinians, certainly that they've ever heard and that they're likely to hear in the, in the foreseeable future. It was Abu Mazen who walked away and said, I turned him down, the gaps were too wide. Why were the gaps too wide? When you look at the narrative issues, the question of the right of return and I want to make the distinction. I'm not talking about return. I think the question of how many thousands of Palestinian refugees might or might not return to Israel has proven negotiable. But there is the issue of the right of return. And on this issue, the, the, uh, the, the, the narratives of the two sides clash completely. From the Israeli standpoint, the 1948 War of Independence was a war of independence and was a just war. And if it created refugee problems, it did so on both sides. And both sides have to solve them. From the Palestinian standpoint, they, as in my understanding, they need a formula to, to close this file in which they understand that the state of Israel acknowledges that it was born in sin in 1948 and that it was wrong and the Palestinians were right. On the holy places issue, 
in, in effect, I can only quote here Abu Mazen and Yasser Arafat at Camp David 2000, Temple Mount, there never was a temple. If you want confirmation of this just a few weeks ago at the UN, here is Abu Mazen saying to the world, I come to you from the Holy Land, the land of the prophets, Jesus and Muhammad. No prophets before Jesus. What does this reflect? It reflects a point of view which is shared not just by Palestinians, but by much of the Arab world, and maybe much of the Muslim world, that there is no Jewish people, that it doesn't have legitimate historic and legal roots in the Holy Land, that the Jews are a bunch of co-religionists, usurpers who came and took Palestinian land uh, uh, with the help of uh, colonialism and imperialism. Uh, I think I've learned the Palestinian narrative. I know I'm never going to change it. I'm never going to persuade Palestinians to change it. But what I believe here, and of course that's reflected in the notion that there never was a temple and that the state of Israel was born in sin, but what I think Abu Mazen has understood, implicitly or explicitly, what I'm learning from his appeal to the UN, is that he's saying, we're going to have to put these, issues, these narrative issues aside for a while and reconfigure this conflict on a state-to-state -state basis. When he goes to the UN, he doesn't ask the UN to determine that the state of Israel was born in sin. He is not asking the UN to determine who owns the Temple Mount. He's asking the UN for three things, sovereignty, borders, capital in Jerusalem. And he wants to come out of the UN experience negotiating, not as chairman of the PLO, with its huge refugee constituency, but as president of the state of Palestine. And if you, I, I, my interpretation of what he's doing is strengthened when I look at the reaction in Arab circles where the refugee issue is a sensitive one. Hamas chief criticism of the UN initiative is that it's abandoning the refugees. You hear this in the camps in Lebanon. King Abdullah the, the second of Jordan is against the initiative because he's afraid that by abandoning the refugee issue he's going to be stuck with his demographic problem with his Palestinian population. So this, this merely confirms the very the daring nature of, of what Abu Mazen is doing. And he can send Hanan Ashrawi to tell the refugees, it's OK, we won't forget you. And he can even mention 194 in one of the documents he submits to the UN. Uh, but it's perfectly clear to, uh, uh, to refugees where this is going. Now, uh, obviously, if you're an Israeli government that is, has a huge settler influence and right-wing influence, if you want to hold on to the territories and build settlements, this isn't going to interest you. If you reject the 1967 lines, as, even with swaps, as the basis for a deal, and you reject the notion of a Palestinian capital in, in, in Jerusalem, you'll find every reason to reject this UN initiative. But the fact is that a majority of Israelis are prepared to listen to the proposition of 67 lines in land swaps, and that uh, two Israeli prime ministers, both Barak and uh, Olmert, have offered the Palestinians a capital in, uh, in Jerusalem. So there's some basis in Israeli public opinion to deal with this positively, even if that's not represented uh, in the current government. What am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that the Palestinian initiative, be, one, because it's a Palestinian initiative, this is the first time in many, many years that the initiative is in Palestinian hands and not in Israeli hands. One, because it's a Palestinian initiative. Two, because it is prioritizing the issues, territory, capital, sovereignty, before the, the pre-67 narrative issues, uh, that this offers an opportunity, an opportunity to leverage this initiative into what I would call a win-win proposition. Now, I'm not deluding myself that anybody is going to submit this win-win proposition to the Security Council or the General Assembly tomorrow. I don't know what's going to come out of there, probably uh, non -observ probably observer, uh, observer state status from the General Assembly, and I, it's impossible to predict what this will or will not change. But I'm suggesting that if we want to move forward, 
we're going to have to start addressing the advantages embodied in the Palestinian initiative and try to remodel them into a win-win state-to-state paradigm. What should it include? The Palestinians are asking for a state. The UN on uh, November, 49th, uh, November 29, 1947, created two states or recommended the creation of two states, Jewish, it's an Arab and Jewish states in mandatory Palestine, Res- Resolution 181. Netanyahu has been insisting that everybody recognize Israel as a Jewish state. This, by the way, is his response to the sense of delegitimization embodied in the Palestinian positions on Temple Mount, on the right of return, on, on then, and who's a prophet and who's not a prophet. The UN created Israel as a Jewish state. Go back to 181. You're going to create a Palestinian state? Reconfirm that Israel was created way back then as a Jewish state. Abu Mazen wants the 67 lines, but in negotiations, Palestinians have already agreed to land swaps. Put the land swaps into the resolution or into the formula. It doesn't have to be a UN formula. It can be a quartet formula or an American formula uh, more than a year from now in the next administration. Uh, Put the land swaps in there to make it more palatable and acceptable and appealing uh, to Israelis. The Palestinians want a capital in Jerusalem. Well, Israel has a capital in Jerusalem which is not recognized by a single country in the world. Recognize two capitals in Jerusalem. This is the opportunity to do it. If you're recognizing one, recognize the other. Uh, Palestinians have already agreed to a, a variety of, uh, uh, of Israeli demands for security provisions, a demilitarized state, a non-militarized state. There are various formulations. Write this in as well. It's something they've agreed to in any case in negotiations and reassure Israelis that their security interests are going to be recognized. Reassure Israelis that this new formula will insist that all issues be negotiated between the two sides. You may recall Abu Mazen wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a few months ago in which he uh, 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 suggested that once he gets UN recognition, he's going to, in effect, transfer the nexus of the conflict away from the negotiating table and to groups like the International Court of Justice. Make sure that where I don't think any, anything positive for a solution to the conflict is going to come out, make sure that both sides accept that they're going to have to negotiate, beginning with the obvious issues of where the border is, where the capital is, what the security issues are, and leaving for later those uh, nar- pre-67 narrative issues which Abu Mazen is already suggesting he's prepared to leave for later because he's turning this into a state-to-state conflict, and as a state-to-state conflict, they will look very different. Put in a provision regarding minority rights to reassure the Arab world that uh, if Israel is reconfirmed as a Jewish state, this is not going to prejudice the the rights of of, of non-Jewish Israelis but also to reassure Israelis that if uh, they choose as settlers, they choose to stay in a Palestinian state, that they'll have rights as well. Not that I think many will do so, but to, to, to achieve balance. Uh, and finally, uh, the Arab Peace Initiative, which we've kind of forgotten in recent months in the shadow of the Arab revolutions, uh, but the Arab Peace Initiative uh, does offer uh, Israel certain uh, incentives for moving ahead toward peace with the Palestinians, uh, aspects of normalization and security. If you're going to, if the UN is going to create a Palestinian state, this is the time for the UN to turn, or for the Quartet, or any other international mediator to turn to the Arab states and say, we're taking a step forward, and if the Israelis agree to this, there should be an Arab quid pro quo to persuade Israelis that there is a reward for making peace with their neighbors and for taking chances for peace. So what have I suggested here? One, time is important. The situation could deteriorate. There is nothing on the agenda. Two, the repeated attempts by the international community to return the parties to the negotiating table based on Oslo. And if you just sit down and negotiate, everything will be all right are looking increasingly pathetic. And I would suggest that a lot of the people who mouth these words 
themselves understand that this is increasingly pathetic because Oslo as we know it and the Oslo menu for final status issues negotiated between Israel and the PLO has run its course and we need a new paradigm. Three, the Palestinian appeal to the UN with all of the problems and dangers involved also presents us with an opportunity to reconfigure uh, uh, the conflict uh, based on a state-to-state -state paradigm that deals first and foremost with state-to-state -state issues, that is to say, borders, uh, security, capital, uh, geography, uh, 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 and so forth. And finally, that there, it is possible to come up with a variety of formula, and I've offered you one, but a variety of formulae for making this kind of reconfiguration. And what's important is to get the international community, and particularly the United States, as the uh, uh, prime or only uh, likely mediator between the two sides, to get it involved in leveraging the Palestinian initiative into a win-win proposition that could enable us to manage the conflict on a far more rational basis, even if we don't determine who owns the Temple Mount in the next 10 or 20 or 100 years, or we don't determine who was right and who was wrong in 1948 for the next 10 or 20 or 100 years with a state-to-state -state model based on this kind of international intervention, the conflict becomes far more manageable. Some of the issues can be solved immediately. Those that aren't no longer hold the rest of the process hostage, and this would be a huge step forward for everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think that's, you know, obviously a very compelling and strategic approach to the Palestinian statehood bid. Unfortunately, what we've seen from the Obama administration has been almost exactly the opposite. They've been running so much resistance to anything involving uh, United Nations application. It's all been phrased in the negative, how do we avoid this, not how do we use this to our advantage. There's not been a jujitsu move from the State Department. It's all been sort of how do we avoid this issue. So I, I want to turn to Rob to sort of see where the, where the players are at. Is, what, what are the prospects of a new win-win approach, either coming from the White House, coming from Europe, maybe the players in the region in, in light of the Arab awakening might step up? Um, where do you see things going? Well, we, li we live in a strange world. And I'm not referring only to the allegations of this strange plot uh, in recent <laughs> days. Um, strange role because here you have the Palestinian leader who's been most committed to negotiations, diplomacy, engagements with Israel. And I'd have some quibble, uh, you'll see, with the characterization of, of Abbas, but we could, we could come back to that. Um, I think he's somebody who actually has always been committed and, and, and on some of the issues that you mentioned probably has uh, a, a, a more forward-looking uh, perspective than, than, than than you described, but here you have somebody who's always been committed, and now is the Palestinian who is the most, who has turned the most forcefully to the UN and to international, uh, international arena, something he's never really done in the past. So that's one, one puzzle, and somebody, why would he, he be the person to do that? You have in Prime Minister Netanyahu somebody whose positions, I suspect, when he puts them on the table, and if he were to negotiate, and if you had the US or the quartet or anyone in the room, his positions would be deemed less acceptable than the Palestinian's position, and yet he's the one who seems to be clamoring for direct talks all the time. And you have the Obama administration, which came into office truly pr promising a much more vigorous, fair-minded, uh, effective approach to the peace process, started on day one and ended up, a little over two years later, having succeeded in alienating not just the Israelis but also the Palestinians, which is a feat, and I, it's not all of their own making, but it's, it's a fact today that there's less trust in, in the U.S. administration from, from both sides, and as Yossi accurately said, very little hope that the administration is going to do anything in the next, in the next year, I mean, and, 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 uh, until, the, until the election. Uh, now, what's the reason for, for, for this, and what, what is it symptomatic of? And I think, it, as, as, as Yossi says, it's symptomatic of something pretty deep. At a surface level, I think it's symptomatic of the fact that right now, from a purely political standpoint, the, what is effective, what is productive, what is 
what makes sense for the three political actors, whether it's Netanyahu, Abbas, or Obama, are to take positions that, in fact, are going to make a return to effective negotiations more difficult. When I, I, when I speak to, to some officials who tell me, well, why didn't Abbas seize his victory of his speech at the UN and all the credit he got to then pivot and go back to negotiations? The answer is simple. The credit he got was because he took a position that, w that showed that he was not prepared to go back to negotiations as business as usual. In other words, the currency he got would be immediately deflated if tomorrow he said, okay, now I'm prepared to go to negotiations without a settlement freeze, without terms of reference. So you can't expect him to use the capital to take a step that would immediately dilapidate it. Pri Prime Minister Netanyahu, yes, he says he wants to go to negotiations, but what, what does he say that resonates deeply with, with Israeli people? It's what Yossi said. It's when he calls for recognition of Israel as a Jewish state, something that makes it very difficult for the negotiations to commence, let alone to succeed, but which enhances his position back home. And President Obama's speech at the UN, which to some extent, I guess you could argue, helps him domestically, although I would, I would question that. I'm not sure how many people would give him credit for giving a speech a year before an election if they had any doubts about his commitment to Israel the day before. So politically, I question the, the, uh, the, the wisdom of the strategy, but definitely it was a speech that was intended in large part to satisfy domestic opinion, but which also makes it harder to get back to negotiations because it discredits the US in Palestinian eyes. So yes, I think that we are now in a, in a moment where domestic politics and the need of leaders to respond to what they feel, either to build or to respond to what they feel are the, the aspirations of their people, are pulling all sides apart. But of course, again, as Yossi said, I think the, the crisis is much deeper. The crisis is of whether we want to call it the Oslo paradigm or whatever paradigm has been governing for the last, uh, for the last two decades. Every single one of its pillars has been eroded, if not <coughs> collapsed. The belief that you had on both sides, coherent, effective leaderships that spoke for and then could deliver for their people. I, mean, I don't need to get into details, but certainly on the, on, on the Palestinian side with the division and with the fragmentation <coughs> of the political, uh, of, of the polity, that's not, no longer the case. <coughs> on the Israeli side with the pow growing power of settler constituencies, of religious constituencies, it's also more difficult, and the fragmentation of the political scene to have a leader that's capable, if he were willing, to make the kind of historic compromises that a peace deal would entail. So that's number one. That was one of the assumptions that, that was guiding it. Uh, the second was that both sides, despite the skepticism, had faith that a peace deal could be achieved through negotiations. Now again, I don't need to go into it in, in detail, but that has completely uh, di uh, disappeared. Again, the, the, what gave President Abbas such a positive reception back home, and it really was, I mean, it, it, it surprised me how, positive, how positively and enthusiastically Palestinians reacted to his stance at the UN is in part because he was breaking with the notion that we're going to go back to negotiations and, and perpetually and, and eternally hope that through uh, in, in a room you're going to reach a deal with Israelis. So the faith that you could get something through negotiations on the Palestinian side has, 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 has uh, evaporated. But that's true on the Israeli side as well. I don't think you'd find many Israelis, again, for, for the reasons Yossi uh, uh, put forth, who believe that negotiations with Palestinians is the way to, to reach a deal. The third pillar was that the U.S. could play an effective mediating role. Now, that may come back someday, but it is no longer the case today. And I don't think you have many who, I mean, just go through the list of things that the U.S. has asked for. Extension of the moratorium, settlement freeze, extension of the moratorium, direct talks without preconditions, no uh, Security Council resolution on settlements, no Security Council resolution on statehood. On all of those, the U.S. made demands that both parties felt free to ignore. So I think the notion that the U.S. has today, and again, this is, not criticism of the Obama administration, I think goes beyond Obama, I think it's sort of a, a more uh, historic pattern, but the notion that the U.S. has a wherewithal today to get the parties to do what it wants them to do is, 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 is for me a thing of the past. And finally, the role of the Arab world, which in the Oslo-Madrid post-conception uh, uh, was to support the moderates, quote-unquote, on the Palestinian side, help them make compromises, reach out to Israel. Again, that's been eroding for some time, the, the, the loss of credibility of pro-American uh, regimes, Saudi, Jordan, Egypt, that had been in decline for some time. With the Arab Spring, it's become all the more difficult with, uh, g given the, again, the, the weight of domestic politics and the fact that these regimes first have to care about re-establishing some degree of legitimacy or not losing whatever legitimacy that they have, doesn't really put them in a position to be pressing Abbas to do anything or to be reaching out to Israel. 
and you add to that the new, uh, Turkey's new weight, the, the fact is you don't have any of the, the building blocks of what was supposed to lead us to a, a, a peace agreement. So I, I, I agree that there's, it's, the, the paradigm has collapsed. <coughs> is there a new paradigm and is the one that UOC has put forward uh, a possibility? Very easy for me. I mean, the easiest position now is to say the paradigm has collapsed, and I don't see a I don't see a very effective one. But it is a position that I that I have to take. I don't see an alternative emerging, and I question again. I think Yossi is pointing in a, in a in an interesting direction, but I would question it on on two levels. First, and if there's a Palestinian in the room, he or she could 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 correct me. I didn't read Abbas's move at the UN quite the way you did. I don't think, and if he intended it, he certainly won't get away with it. But I don't think he intended it as an attempt to substitute the Palestinian state for the PLO. The attacks he came under were attacks by people who suspected that, and very quickly he and others had to, uh, had to counterattack. say that was not the point. He made very clear in his speech at the UN that this was not intended to, to in any way uh, downplay the role of the PLO or to ignore the refugees, and much of his speech was about the refugees, which again was one of the reasons why Palestinians back home were so and elsewhere were so enthusiastic about it. Members of the diaspora who have been critical of Abu Mazen now for years told me they discovered a new Abu Mazen precisely because he put on the table a narrative that went back to 1948 and that spoke about the refugees. So I don't know that politically, again, if one assumes that his goal was to go to state-to-state -state relations and put on the back burner other issues and say that the state is going to now uh, negotiate with Israel and not the PLO, if that was his intent, which again, I don't believe it was, I don't think that it's one that is politically palatable right now uh, uh, for, for, the pal for, for, for this leadership. I'm interested, since you just met him, what, what, what you make of it. So first of all, I don't think that's what he had in mind. I think what he had in mind was symptomatic of what, and, and, and it's the first paradox I mentioned. Here you have somebody who always believed in negotiations, always believed in diplomacy, always believed in reaching out to the US and to Israel, who's taking a step that is contradicting all of those precepts, He's the last, pal he was the first Palestinian to believe in negotiations. He's the last one who give them up. But he too has to respond to what he sees, the public mood, his own <coughs> conviction after having met with Netanyahu several times. He just doesn't believe right now that he could simply go back to negotiations as usual. And that's what the UN was symptomatic of. It's a statement that things simply are not working. We need something else. I don't think the Palestinians have that something else. I don't think they have that strategy. I think it's really tiptoeing right now with a break from the past, but without really knowing uh, where they're going to go. So that's the, the, the first reason why I'm somewhat skeptical that this opens up the, 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 the avenue. Now, the other reason, which is one that I'm, I'm happy to be convinced otherwise, I'm not, and, and frankly, I think, you know, you said, how could we convince the U.S.? I think the U.S. has bought onto the model that it should be borders and, and security first. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the president said. So certainly that's, that's become the new article of faith. Um, maybe it works. I have a hard time imagining that President Abbas and Prime Minister Netanyahu, even if they were only negotiating borders and security, could reach an agreement. They're very far apart on those issues as well. I mean, that's what they discussed. They discussed security in the three meetings they had, and they got nowhere. So the notion that this is what is holding it up, so, so I think, raises a lot of doubts. I also am not sure how you cabin them off. Uh, and you'll see, you said in your, in, your, in, in your presentation that, you know, whatever resolution comes out could say there's a Jewish state. Um, because that, that, that's in 181, which is accurate, but that does open up the issues of 48, that does force the Palestinians to put other issues on the table. I'm not so sure, and, I'm, and I doubt that you'd have a Palis an Israeli leader who'd be prepared to withdraw from 95, 96, 97 percent of the West Bank without having in return recognition of Israel as a Jewish state, which the Palestinians either won't give or will only give if they get something on refugees and on Jerusalem. So I'm not sure that you could truly untie the, uh, the, this knot. Um, now, as I said, I, I'm going to take the easy way out compared to Yossi because I don't have right now an answer. What I think we need to find is a way to use the next year, which I think is going to be a dead year, unfortunately. But I don't, I, don't, I don't see, I mean, I think, and I agree entirely with Yossi, that people sort of, when they don't know what to do, they go to negotiations. So the quartet is desperate. It doesn't know what to do. And now you ask members of the quartet, you ask them, do you think negotiations could succeed? No. If they fail, are we going to be in a worse position than we are today? Maybe. Then why are you going there? Because there's nothing else. Which is really probably the most um, unwise reason to go to something because you can't think of anything better. But it is, reflexively, anyone you talk to in the court said, well, we have to have negotiations. I don't think you have to have negotiations. I think negotiations right now are a recipe 
for further polarizing the situation, for further uh, convincing the parties that there's no way out, and how do you deal with the, with the collapse of the talks? So I think this is a very short-term approach which the U.S., the U.N., the Europeans, to some extent the Russians are taking, and I, and I, I would hope that they would reconsider it. Now, th what could you do during that year? And I'm going to stop now. I think there are things that you could work on which probably are not that popular, but I think the, Arth the Palestinians need to get their domestic house in order. I think that's absolutely critical. I think the Shalit deal may open up new avenues for, um, for reconciliation. I think we need to deal with the issue of Gaza so that that doesn't become uh, yet again a, a powder keg. I think you have to find ways, and you could do it perhaps, uh, to, to, to improve the life of Palestinians, although that's, not, that's obviously not a long-term solution. And you have to take this time, this year, to rethink all the issues that Yossi and I put on the table and to think of a different paradigm, which, frankly, at this point, I don't have. I, I, I think there are elements in what Yossi said that might point in the right direction. But I think the crisis is deep enough that we need to take the time to think about how you address all these issues, the issues of Palestinian leadership, the issue of Israeli leadership, the issue of complete lo loss of faith in the possibility of a solution, the, 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 the declining role of the US, and the changes in the Arab world, which I think make it a requirement for us to do what some of us hope the Obama administration would have done from day one, which is uh, to reset, press the reset button on this conflict as well and think of a different way forward. Well, thank you, Rob. So it's, it's interesting to see uh, a, little, a little bit of pessimism uh, in terms of not having a solution. <laughs> but um, in light of the, in light of Prime Minister Fayyad's, you know, from the ground up peacemaking approach, whether, whether that's going to work or not is, is to be seen. But I'm really interested, Nadia, in your perspective on uh, Chairman Abbas. You met with him in New York. Um, what, were the, what are the strategic implications when he, when he went home to Palestine in terms of the UN? Is there enough forward momentum to keep him uh, afloat for now? I know that he's, he told Newsweek, uh, after the February vote on settlements at the United Nations that o Obama told them to go up a tree. Uh, Obama had a ladder to go down the tree, took the ladder away, and Abbas had to jump. So is Abbas still in that tree, or is he out of it at this stage? I think he's still on the tree. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you for coming on a rainy day. Uh, really brave of you to come. Um, the conventional wisdom, I think, always that um, in terms of negotiation is um, madness is trying this, the same thing twice and expecting different results. And I think really this is applies very much to the negotiation concept. And if you look at it uh, through what um, both Yusei and Rob said, uh, for the last 20 years, the negotiation has not brought anything tangible for the Palestinians. What they did is they created an authority that manages the occupation for them. And if you go to the West Bank and you see Ramallah that always been held as a, a great model of success, that you know, uh, Prime Minister Fayyad is doing a great job, uh, and I'm not diminishing from his achievement, but the fact that once you step out of Ramallah and you wanted to go to a city like Nablus or Jenin, you will see a checkpoint, an Israeli checkpoint. <coughs> Could be created overnight, it will stop even the president from moving from one place to another. So the reality on the ground contradicts very much of uh, the concept that the Palestinian gains something tangible from Oslo. So I agree with you. Second is about negotiations, is if you look at all the final status issues, which is border, security, Jerusalem, uh, with the exception of refugees, and I'll talk about it now, uh, everything is dictated from an Israeli point of view. The Palestinians have nothing in return to give because it is the Israelis who, they're going to sit with the strongest part, and that's the Israelis, and they are the weaker part, and they have to, neg to negotiate accordingly. The refugees being outside, and they have to agree into com some kind of settlement. So from, I think from this point of view, the, ne the negotiation has not brought anything. Abbas' popularity and the PA in the West Bank in particular was very low. And therefore, they looked at the options around them. And basically, for the lack of any options, they decided to go to an international forum where they got support. And that was the driving force behind Abbas' decision to, to go to the UN. And many of you probably read the report that actually the final point that pushed him to go to the Security Council as opposed to go to the General Assembly 
was basically um, the proposal that was given by the Americans with Dennis Ross and David Hale that it was nothing. It was even described by Palestinian officials as insulting. So he decided that the best way to change the dynamics on the ground is to create something new, considering what's happening in the Arab Spring now and uh, you know, the Palestinians leading the concept of uh, nonviolent resistance in the first intifada. So he wanted to bring the attention back to him and to give him a card that will strengthen him in the negotiation. I don't think it was a substitute for the negotiation. But as you said, now the quartet talking about uh, returning back to negotiation on October 23rd in Jordan, but there is nothing absolutely changed to make uh, these two parties coming together. And the administration seems to be adamant that uh, the two parties actually will meet in Jordan. On what basis, on what, what the preparations, how the conditions on the ground has changed, or the conditions rather the Palestinian spot, which is a freeze on the settlements, uh, number one, and having a terms of reference, number two, to make to or accepting 67 as the basis for negotiation. These things have not been acceptable to the, to the Israelis, but they have not accepted them so far. So why would you go back to negotiate? So the quartet concept has to be reconstructed altogether. And I think the fact that also that the Palestinians have deep mistrust in the uh, representative of the quartet, Tony Blair, has a, a, a play in the, um, in, in, the, uh, in the bigger picture of whether to come to the negotiation or not, uh, and also having the U.S. being, I mean, the Palestinians knew from, from the beginning that the U.S. is not a partial player in the negotiation. But the reason they need them is because it's the only power in the world that can exert pressure on Israel. And that's, I think, the important uh, point here. It's not because they think they are uh, going to be an honest broker. I mean, the official stated policy that Israel is a strategic ally of the United States. And uh, we, they always side with Israel no matter what. And we have seen how the United States take their neck out in the UN Security Council. It's not just they said that they're going to veto the decision. But they're actually lobbying actively every single country. And if they're not lobbying, I'll use the word bullying them to say do not vote for them. And they take it even one step further, which is really ridiculous. They're even lobbying countries to vote against Palestinian membership in UNESCO, which is an organization that cares about education and science. But despite everything else, I think, from an American point of view, they have to show that they're the only true friends that st stays with Israel no matter what. And from the Palestinian point of view, they need the Americans because they're the one who can pressure Israel. There's nobody else who can tell them, if you accept this deal, you have to do this or you have to do that. And um, saying that, I agree that American impact in the Middle East is receding, considering what's happening in the Arab Spring. And now maybe there's a new... Um, a proposal, I don't know if it's going to be accepted or not by the French. So there is new actors coming, but I still believe for the time being the United States will be the major player in the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I agree with you that maybe this is not the time for negotiation because you're not going to achieve anything from negotiation. I don't even believe that the parties can get together to start with because it's not just the gaps are so big, but the principle and the conditions that President Abbas put, and he cannot be less uh, Palestinians than the Americans when it comes to say freeze the settlements and the Israelis said no and they said okay I'll forgive you let's start from nothing and the Israelis very the Israeli government is very clever always of saying to people who don't know the conflict very well well we're willing to negotiate with that preconditions as if they're the one who you know the party who is just compromising which is completely the opposite uh, um, uh, picture now um, I, I actually tend to be a little bit more optimistic than Rob when it comes to describing the, the situation as it stands now, because I think the dynamics in the ground are changing so rapidly that nobody can predict what's going to happen. And I'll give you an example. A um, few days ago, the news broke that Israel and Hamas decided to release Gilad Shalit, who was an Israeli soldier who was held, kidnapped by Hamas for five years in return for 1,027 Palestinian prisoners. This deal has been on going on for a long time, and probably in 2009 they came closer to do it, and they didn't, etc. And if you read the analysis, everybody trying to wonder wh what's the importance of the timing now, why um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Hamas, whether it's Khalid Mishal in Damascus or the leadership in Gaza, decided to close this deal. 
And some will say the, the window is closing up. They don't know what's going to happen. Um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been hailed as the, uh, le the le he's shown leadership in negotiating with an organization that, strangely enough, the United <coughs> States put it on the state uh, on as a terrorist organization, and uh, somehow its closest ally is allowed to negotiate with the terrorist organization. That that's fine. So the fact that uh, Hamas and Israel decided to do this deal is, I think, is very significant. And if you remember when Abbas decided to go to the UN, um, the Israelis were the first against it, uh, using the word that they're going to delegitimize de Israel, which is, in Palestinian perspective, it's the opposite, actually. They're asking to legitimize the Palestinian state alongside Israel. The Americans who were ver very um, active in lobbying everybody against it. And the third party was Hamas. They didn't want Abbas to go to the UN. And they, w they have been given statements and talking publicly and denouncing the move, etc. Last night, actually, I was reading an interesting report that the chief negotiator of Fatah in Cairo has met with Khalid Mish'al, who is visiting Cairo now, and probably will be there until the finalization of the deal with uh, the release of Gilad Shalit and the Palestinian prisoners. And he expressed to Abbas uh, what a great move that he did at the UN, that he supports him for everything that he did. And Hamas uh, has added that whatever means that the U.S. diplomatic or, 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 or military or whatever, that basically this is a very important step in the long run of achieving uh, a Palestinian, independent Palestinian state. And they express this uh, love to, to, towards each other, both Abbas thanking uh, Mish'al for uh, releasing the prisoners and Mish'al thanking Abbas for going to the UN, which is a really interesting development. And I think it's dictated by what's happening around them. And most of you obviously uh, very uh, nuanced when it comes to the Arab Spring and uh, Hamas losing base in Damascus and most likely migrating towards Cairo. Iran role as well in terms of uh, supporting Hamas. Um, and this competition always, I think for the last 20 years, you have seen on the ground the disappearance almost of, of other faction within the PLO, which is the leftist factions. And now what you have on the ground is a de facto two, state, two parties, which is Fatah and Hamas. I mean, you can talk about other small parties like Al Mubadara or like Al, uh, the third party, but they don't really have much support. The support is stands basically between these two parties. And at one stage, I felt that I cannot see any kind of reconciliation between them, regardless if the Egyptians were, during Mubarak, were playing the role that they're the good guys bringing them together and using it as a leverage with the US or whatever. But I think the party themselves felt that they cancel each other if they decided to uh, unify. Because for the first time, Hamas had the chance to govern in a place. And they're not going to give up this easily, because everybody knows if there is an election today in Gaza, well, maybe before the, election, the release of Shalit, because now their popularity has went up, they will lose. So it's not really an, their interest to have a unity government, because ultimately the next step will be to have election. And if they have election, they will lose. Why would they, would they do that? But now because the, the dynamics shift in so quickly, and because Hamas, unlike the Islamic Jihad, is a, is a political party and very pragmatic. And the reason they are in power now, because they decided to benefit from Oslo, although they didn't recognize the previous agreements, and to compete in an election. And they won in a, tra a transparent election. But we can argue whether they are able to make that transition from being uh, a movement into a, um, a party or a government that accountable to the people, or whether the blockade or the international community fought them from day one. Whatever reason that they failed, they did not really deliver. So basically, they were not really popular, along the everything else that they introduced when curtailing civil liberties and rights of women and lots of things that make life miserable for people in Gaza in particular. But I actually, for the first time, I believe now of, of, the, of what's happening in the Middle East and, the, and the, the decision now between these two parties, Hamas and Israel, to, to get together and to release Shalit. Maybe I'm reading too much to it, but I think it will open a new um, kind of thinking that ultimately maybe we will see some kind of reconciliation because we all know there is not one single liberation movement in history achieved anything being divided. 
and the division is so huge. I mean, you go to the West Bank and you go, you go to Ramallah and you go to Gaza as if you go into two different worlds completely. They don't relate to each other. So maybe the reconciliation is on the horizon and maybe something will happen. I'm not 100% sure. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about, the Arab Peace Initiative that you mentioned. And uh, many times when you come through Washington and people talk about um, this is the last opportunity for, I, I heard Amr Musa saying millions of times, this is the last opportunity for the Israelis to uh, accept it. Because basically, if, if they accept it, they will have recognition, not just immediate normalization of relationship, not just from 22 Arab countries, but with 55 uh, Muslim countries. And if you look now at these Arab initiatives, I mean, the Arab League is not recognizable anymore. You look at the countries there, they're no longer there. So the leadership is changing very fast. And although, it's of course, Saudi Arabia is going to be there for a while, and Egypt, and, uh, and uh, I mean, Jordan. <laughs> but I think even that is not guaranteed in the long run. This is might change very quickly, because um, the, the initiative that proposed by Arab regimes, the Arab regimes are no longer there. You, are change, you have a, a, a huge movement in, in the Middle East, whether it's going to succeed or not, whether it's going to change for the better or for the worse. But wh what we can guarantee is it's no longer the status quo that has been in the Middle East, dominated everything for the last 20 years. So I will say that um, the, uh, the, uh, the change in the dynamic now might actually bring a new opportunity. And if Netanyahu, I will give him the benefit of the doubt, some will say that actually he did the, uh, the Shalit uh, um, deal so he doesn't have to compromise more. So he can say after all this pressure on him, and it's not just the Americans decided to veto it, but even when they, veto, when they were going to veto it, um, the Israelis poked them in the eye and said, you know what, we're going to build 1,300 new housing units in Jerusalem, and you know what, we appoint in this new uh, task force to legalize even the outpost settlements. So he's given too much to the right-wing uh, constituents in, 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 his, in, in the settlers' community and in his own cabinet as well. So it could be both ways. I mean, I, I cannot read him very well, but I think what we've seen is you can, for sure, you cannot wait for another year because another year is always things get worse, not better. Well, I, uh, I want to tie into that sorry. what you're saying about Netanyahu, because um, I think it's I think it's interesting that um, he is sort of koshering, you might say, the outposts sort of retroactively. There is a lot of moves to a appease his right wing coalition. Yossi, is there the political will to pursue the kind of approach that you want to take? Uh, could Netanyahu actually do that with his current coalition? Um, would they be willing to um, to do something, you know, bolder, as you're saying, or is Rob's critique that if this isn't going to work out at the moment maybe ring true in this context? You know, one of the interesting things of spending a few weeks in the United States and talking about these issues is picking up on uh, theories about Netanyahu that are apparently stronger here than back home. For example, he's like a character in a novel, yeah. No, for <laughs> example, as long as his father is alive. Yeah. For cannot. example, <laughs> as long as Sarah is his wife. Okay? <laughs> Look, three, almost three years ago, Netanyahu uh, benefited from a wave of hawkish sentiment in Israel, generated not a little by the failures of peace processes and the failures of uh, unilateral withdrawals, and set up a very right wing coalition, even with labor and now it's no longer even labor. Uh, if you take his fundamental views together with the nature of his coalition, to my mind, it should have been clear to the quartet and to the Israeli peace camp, for that matter, two and a half years ago, that it's pointless to lobby for a peace process. That this government, even if it deigns to enter a peace process, is not going to go very far, with, OK? But, uh, uh, so that. I mean, that's my answer to it. The answer is no. Now, Netanyahu is <laughs> clever. He's figured out Obama. He's figured out a lot of American public opinion yeah. from Congress. Here, we can just He's get got us. pretty solid uh, is, uh, is support in Israel. It goes up and down. The social justice movement brought it down. Gil Achalid has brought it back up. There's no threat to his coalition. And uh, it, when he pokes his finger in the eyes of the administration by building another uh, you know, after Obama's very pro-Israel speech, Billy and others, 
I mean, it, he, he's basically saying I can do whatever I want. Certainly in this year, in this coming year, I can do whatever I want. I want. Uh, sorry if some you didn't hear me, uh, and, and get away with it. Uh, so I mean, these are the facts of life. But I have to add, Rob, that it's I would I would argue that Abu Mazen not only understands, or that we should all not only understand that uh, Netanyahu is not a candidate to give up uh, 96 percent of the West Bank, and he's not a, in return for anything or nothing. Uh, but that I would argue that uh, Abu Mazen now understands that after Olmert especially, he's not going to find an Israeli partner who can compromise to the extent necessary from the Palestinian standpoint, not just on territory, but on those narrative issues. And this is why he's going to the UN. And that even if he, uh, uh, I mean, yes, he paid a lot of lip service to the PLO and the refugees in his UN speech and so on and so forth, but there are facts here. If they come out of state, this is the end of Oslo, and Israel can legitimately argue that this is the end of Oslo, and that it has a new negotiating partner, the state of Palestine. And if Netanyahu has any sense at all, or any future prime minister, they, they will say, we, we, we no longer negotiate with the P Palestine Liberation Organization, with its refugee constituency. We negotiate with our neighbor, the state of Palestine. They want to put the refugee issue on the table, fine. We'll say to them, you're a sovereign state, you can give a passport to any refugee you want, any, any Palestinian you want anywhere, you can resettle them at any time you want inside of Palestine. The issue is over. Whoever heard of one state asking another state to, to, uh, to absorb its own citizens uh, or its potential citizens? Uh, I can't read Abu Mazen's mind. And by the way, when I asked him about this a few months ago in Ramallah, he said something which I liked very much because it's, it's what pol politicians do, but they never admit it. He said, I'm going to answer you in deliberately vague sentences. <laughs> because he's not showing his cards. The one who is showing his cards is Fayyad, because you can, in, in Fayyad, in Fayyad's statements, you can see a clear understanding, a much clearer understanding that this is the approach. But again, none of this is going to produce any kind of process whatsoever in the coming year, because of Obama, because of Netanyahu. And beyond that, I, simp I don't know. None of us knows. But we have to begin to change, to, to change the paradigm and to recognize the failures of the past. So uh, Rob, I want to hear your take on that before we turn to the audience. And also, forgot to mention we have people live streaming this online. So hello to you and people on Twitter, maybe. Uh, but Rob, Sarkozy came out at the UN with sort of, uh, with a speech, a bit of a surprise. Europe is seemingly taking a more enhanced role, maybe carrying the torch from the US. Now, Europe hasn't really done much in the quartet context, and I think we've seen High Representative Kathy Ashton really follow Washington's lead and not really do anything bold or creative. But are we entering a period where France, the European Three, the European Union might do something different and creative, or we should curb our enthusiasm, as your new, new uh, ICG report is titled? I mean, they're going to try to be more active, but, you know, what, as they see the U.S. Uh, less so, they'll try to be more, act more active. I'm not sure that we should hold our breath for a more bold, creative, or successful policy. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't, uh, I, don't, I, don't quite, I don't quite see that on the horizon. Um, and again, the, the, the sort of reflex, which is to say we've got to go back to negotiations, which I've heard time and again from Europeans, and which they can't back up with a logical argument. That's what I find most perplexing. Um, in terms of what Yossi said, I don't have, I don't have any disagreement. Uh, um, I, I, I don't, I, again, I don't think, I think we shouldn't ascribe too much of a strategic motivation to what Abu Mazen did. Um, I, I've, I've, I've liked to argue that there is a alternative Palestinian strategy out there that's in search of a leadership. In other words, there are things that Palestinians could do that, is, that are quite different. They could truly try to internet. I'm not saying that I that I would support it. I just say those are ideas that you hear if you speak to the intellectual political class in Palestine. Truly trying to internationalize the conflict, not just simply by going to the UN. Popular resistance, uh, reconciliation, other forms. That is a different strategy, which would for some time mean no negotiations. In fact, a crisis with Israel and probably a real crisis with the U.S. 
I don't think the current Palestinian leadership, I don't think President Abbas at this point is, is going. I don't think that's where he wants to go. I think he still views the UN move as a move to strengthen his hand in negotiations, whether with Netanyahu or with someone else. I don't see it on his part as a gambit to completely upend the, 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 the paradigm of the past. But as I said, it's out there and it may happen almost unwittingly because the Palestinians may be going down a path from which they can't, uh, they can't go back. All right, well, let's, let's turn to our audience. Um, we have my colleague Tom, who's also with the Middle East Channel here, helping us out. You can go to Steve here. You can just give your name and affiliation, please. I'm Steve Barr. I'm the uh, editorial assistant of the uh, Journal of Palestine Studies. Um, my brief question or possible point for discussion has to do with uh, Yossi's characterization of the PLO. Um, to me, the PLO does not so much <coughs> represent, in a strong way, the refugee con con uh, constituency as it has in the past. Since Oslo, uh, to me, that, that relationship has been gradually severed and it has come to be much more a body under the control of or under the, the influence of um, Israel and the United States. And their ability to influence the makeup of that body, including <coughs> uh, keeping Hamas off of it, for example, has enabled them to maintain this post-Oslo equilibrium. The paradigm shift that you suggested under which Israel begins negotiating with the PLO, uh, with the state of Palestine instead of the PLO, would mean not only forfeiting the PLO's status, which was specifically designed as part of the Oslo agreements as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians, but would also mean Israel implicitly recognizing the existence of a state of Palestine, which has been heretofore totally <coughs> anathema to Israel's policy positions. Um, so what would be the implications from that end of, of, of that sort of paradigm shift? How would, would it, um, it benefit Israel? Why would Israel see it in its favor to be, fav to be favorable to its interests? To recognize the existence of a state of Palestine and forfeit, um, the, in other words, negotiating with a partner that it has been able to select and carefully groom to make sure that um, uh, the person sitting across from it on the table, on the other end of the table, doesn't go too far beyond certain limits, shall we say. Okay. Sorry. Do, do anyone want to start on yeah, that? Maybe Yossi first. Sure. Was um, I, you're certainly right to point out that the, the, the image of the PLO has changed since Oslo. And uh, as co-editor of Bitter Lemons, I, I constantly encounter experts who confuse the PA and the PLO in their writing. They assert True. that the PA is Israel's negotiating partner, and they, they seem to make no distinction whatsoever between them. Um, but uh, I mean, nevertheless, the PLO is Israel's negotiating partner, and not the PA. The only thing the PA can talk about is with uh, Barak, let's say, to discuss secure border security issues uh, and the like, and the mis distinction is maintained uh, quite closely. Uh, whether the PLO has uh, become a lackey of Israel in the U.S., as you're implying, is uh, something I'm, I, I have not perceived, but uh, you're, you're free to comment on it. Um, now, uh, why recognize the state of Palestine and forfeit the PLO as a partner? Look, uh, if you believe that occupation of all or parts of the West Bank is far more a burden on Israel than it is an asset, okay? If you believe that the occupation is eating up Israel from, from inside, if you believe that we can withdraw from the West Bank, including the Jordan Valley, and find and get Palestinians to agree to viable security provisions that uh, compensate us for giving up this so-called uh, strategic depth, uh, 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 as I do, as I believe all of this. And if you believe that we're not going to be able to bridge the gaps on the narrative issues anytime soon, and yet we all have to get on with life, Palestinians have to get on with building their state, and Israelis have to get on with being, with really becoming a Jewish and a democratic state that doesn't occupy its neighbors. Then you see a deal here. Then you see a deal here. Because then it makes sense for Israel to recognize the state of Palestine uh, uh, on borders, on agreed borders, and to withdraw even if we don't end the issues that only the PLO is 
appointed and qualified to negotiate. Now, the PLOs are partner under Oslo, but a, 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 it's, it's fair to say that if indeed the PLO, which represents the Palestinians in the UN, not the PA, the PLO goes to the UN and says recognize the state, then it's fair for Israel to say, okay, this is the end of Oslo as we know it because uh, we, we were, because a state is not mentioned in the Oslo agreement, only final status is mentioned, this has now been made a fait accompli. We are free to address the state of Palestine. Now again, the state of Palestine a, a, accredited by the UN, even as an observer state, based on the 67 borders, is not something that Netanyahu is likely to recognize. But there are plenty of people in Israel who think that's not a bad idea to change the, the, the paradigm in this way. And then it, and, uh, but again, you, you, uh, I don't see this, I don't see the current Israeli government as a candidate for doing any of this. Frankly, I don't think Netanyahu knows how he will respond to uh, observer state status uh, in the UN. What he's going to do about it. There are all kinds of options on the table. Annex uh, the Jordan Valley. Uh, annex the settlement blocks. Uh, a, a, Cut off all relations. Right. Uh, do absolutely nothing. Um, uh, and uh, frankly, I, I, I think Netanyahu is more the, uh, the consummate politician who gets up in the morning and just tries to figure out how he's going to spin through the day. Uh, and, and he hasn't decided this yet. But again, we're living in a very changing Middle East, and, it, and it, 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 this is some, you know, you don't look just at the Palestinian issue, you look at what's going on in a much bigger circle around us. And it's very difficult to decide today what you're going to do if and when. So to follow up I mean, on that. Just two, two, two points on that. Sure. And um, but my, I think the one interesting thing is just in the context of the Arab Spring is whether the Palestine Liberation Organization and the PA are any more sustainable than Mubarak or any of the other regimes. But Rob, uh, please. I'm not going to address that. But, but, but um, on your question, I, you know, we could talk for a long time about the status of the PLO. Certainly it's not been an effective body. Certainly it's not been representative over, for, for many years. And I think Palestinians would be, many Palestinians would be the first to, uh, to admit it. But it has a symbolic, symbolic weight. And I think that's why there was such criticism at first, at least among some, particularly in the diaspora, about the Palestinians' move uh, seeking to, to, to have uh, recognition of the Palestinian state. I think Palestinians will not, I don't think President Abbas can afford to, and, uh, and again, I don't think he wants to substitute the Palestinian state as a negotiating party. Israel may say you do it, but I think the Palestinians still have the right to decide who's going to negotiate on their behalf, and my assumption is that they'll insist yeah. that it be the PLO. I just met a few days ago with people from Hamas who are not even in the PLO, and yet they were adamant that the PLO had to remain the absolute representative and it couldn't be, you couldn't replace it with the Palestinian state. Of course, they harbor the hope of entering the PLO, but beyond it, they, they see the symbolic value. And it would be, I think, a very risky move for the current leadership to say, well, we're accepting the Palestinian state. Mind you, Palestinian state already exists. It was proclaimed in 1988. Uh, many countries recognize it. That didn't change the fact that the PLO still is the one. And of course, if the UN recognizes it, it changes its status. But the PLO, in my view, will still remain the one that would, uh, that would negotiate. Um, on, on the Israeli part, I, always, I felt now, as Yossi said, it's not something perhaps that Netanyahu would or could have done. I felt the smartest move the, the Israelis could have taken months ago was to say, not only do we not mind what the Palestinians are doing at the UN, we're going to be the first country to recognize the state of Palestine, but of course, now let's sit down and negotiate borders, security, etc. But you want to call yourself a state? Fine, you're a state. You know? Now deal with, and I think they could have even been smart to say, now, now you should deal with building your state, the existential issues, refugees and everything we could deal with once you've established yourself as a genuine state. So build up, and now let's negotiate. Like two states, uh, b you know, border. Uh, let's have a border negotiation over where the, the border will be, and sort of diffuse the emotional aspects of the crisis. I think that would have been a clever move on the Israeli part. It would have completely pulled the, the rug from underneath. I mean, what what benefit would the Palestinians have had to have recognition of a state if Israel accepted it? The whole point was to do something that Israel would find uh, 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 antagonistic. So it would have taken, you know, completely burst the bubble, um, deflated it. Uh, but I think, I mean, there are many reasons why Israel didn't do it, but I, but I could see very strong benefit for them to try to, to turn this into what Yossi just described as a state-to-state -state negotiation where issues like refugees, you know, as, as Yossi said, how many states are calling for their citizens to be uh, settled elsewhere? So that, that would have given, I think, Israel a stronger hand um, that chose not to do it for, for other reasons. Do you want to add anything, Nadia? Or? 
next? No, I mean, just like one thing, which is basically they were worried about being members of the ICG and other things that if they ICG? were ICG, I don't enough. know. I don't know that we'd admit them. I, uh, ICC. ICC, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, then ICG too. No, we wouldn't admit <laughs> With the ICC and others, so they will be tried as war criminals, so they were worried about that too. Great. Thank you. My name is Saeed Eric. I'm from a good day in this paper. I have a quick question for Rob. You said that the next year will be dead. What about the year after, assuming that Obama wins re-election? Well, it's not just Obama. It's also what happens in Israel and in Palestine. I think, I mean, dead, you know, as, as both of my, my colleagues here have said, you can't, you can't predict what's going to happen. And, and to say that we're giving up on a year is a pretty tall order. I think things need to be done. Uh, they just simply the things that need to be done don't entail having the two parties negotiate. I think there's much more productive things that can be done, again, in terms of getting the Palestinian House on order, changing our policy towards Palestinian unity, changing the policy towards, uh, uh, towards Gaza, trying to see whether things could be done on the ground that would actually begin to lessen Israel's footprint even more. I mean, some of the issues uh, that, that Nadia mentioned. You, you could see that tr and at the same time use the time to think of a different approach to, uh, to, to, to what's going to be done. You know, I, I say a year because of Obama's, uh, because of the re-election, but you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit arbitrary, but just use this time to do things to try to avoid the worst, which is renewal of violence, uh, collapse of, 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 of institutions, um, whether it's Gaza or in the West Bank, uh, uh, renewed violence, and use the time to, to prevent the worst things, to, to, to try to shore up what you can to change the approach on some core issues, as I said, on, on the Palest Palestinian unification side, and think about what you're going to do next. And you know, if if Obama is reelected, then we'll have to see what happens in Israel. And uh, you know, unfortunately, what one wh I, I don't want to be more pessimistic than I was, but if I listen to Yossi, not only does he say nothing could happen to Netanyahu, but there's no reason to believe Netanyahu wouldn't be reelected. So we're going to mm -hmm. have to learn to live with perhaps a new Netanyahu coalition and 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 try to figure out a way with him. Uh, to move forward, however difficult people may think it will be. On Obama, what, is, what course would you like to take in the second round? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, my, my we, we don't do speculation. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I don't think he's given much thought to that. I think his first thought is to get reelected. So. so I think we'll take uh, three questions just so we can get everyone. Can we start with Khalid in the back? Um, your point about why Israel didn't sort of try to preempt the, the Palestinian UN bid by, by simply accepting it and pull the rug out from underneath them. Do you, I, I'd like to hear actually the reactions from, from all three panelists. Um, could one reason be simply that Abbas has called everyone's bluff and that it, at the end of the day, both Israel and the United States were, uh, were not as supportive of a two-state solution as they uh, claimed that they in fact were. I mean, there was, there sort of, what I mean by that is, you know, here they were presented with an opportunity to enshrine, you know, to register the two-state solution with, uh, with the UN officially as it's being sort of eroded on the ground. Um, and when push came to shove, Obama, who has said that a two-state solution is a vital national security interest of the United States, he chose, instead of the outcome, he chose the process. And he even mentioned that in his speech, that it's not the goal that matters, it's how you get there. And so by sort of prioritizing the process over the substance or the process over the outcome, um, and now we see Congress is cutting funding, um, we see you know, Israel um, uh, sort of also, I think, ambivalent on the funding issue, or at least not, not weighing in uh, strongly. Um, doesn't that suggest that at the end of the day, they're somewhat ambivalent about a two-state solution and that Abbas has effectively called their bluff? Let's just, we'll take two questions, but you guys can all answer that. Um, let's take this gentleman, second round. Uh, I'm uh, Vandara Tunisi. I'm an intern at the National Democratic Institute. Um, a lot of the discussion today has been based on the assumption that um, there's going to be a successful outcome from this Palestinian bid uh, for statehood. Um, my question is, how does that paradigm shift that we talked about today materialize you know, with the likely failure of the, of the UN bid? And how, how would we see that in the short term, in the next five and ten years, or ten years from now? Okay, and then first row here. 
I'm Tom Getman, a former NGO executive in the Middle East and uh, was part of the observer team in South Africa during the sanctions legislation period. And I still spend four months a year there. Uh, Ambassador Oren this morning wrote a very deflecting article, uh, op-ed, um, about Tom Friedman and um, Christoph and other authors saying that is Israel is on a very down, dangerous downward slope. Um, Sorry, McDesey, Professor McDesey said there's a huge change on college campuses with progressive Jews not towing the party line anymore. Is there a possibility that uh, restiveness on the campuses and in the synagogues and in the churches of the United States will have a role to play uh, like happened during the South Africa period where there really were surprises? So we have three easy questions. Um, <laughs> whether is, has Obama chosen process over outcome? Has he prioritized the moribund peace process over the actual stated policy of the US of a two-state solution? I think the implicit question about the failure of the UN bid is if these expectations are built up so high and nothing comes of it, what's going to actually happen? And then Israel is increasingly isolated. <clears throat> Where is the American community going to stand? So, um, Nadia, do you want to talk yeah, first I'll, about I'll Khaled's talk, question? Yeah, uh, very quickly. I think, I actually believe that both administration and the Israelis believe in the two-state solution, whether they don't have uh, the vision of how to reach it. And they believe it strongly because they hate the alternative, which is the disappearance of a two-state solution and having one state where everybody is equal and one man, one vote. So they don't want that because it's no longer Jewish or democratic, and you know that. Um, and also the fact, again, I stress that America has to stand, up, to stand with Israel no matter what. And you hear this from administration officials that they have to be seen as this, the friend that will stick up with Israel in the sea of states that are against them and the isolation, losing allies like Turkey and Egypt now. So no matter what, even if whatever, uh, w w w even if you don't know the details of the resolution, they will still vo vote with Israel on, on this particular issue. Um, uh, second is the Palestinians know it is uh, a symbolic move. I don't think there is high expectation there. Everybody know, but uh, again, out of frustration, out of uh, lack of belief that the negotiation will uh, materialize into anything tangible, they decided to go to the UN. Um, and I think to have the, the whole world community behind you, it gives you some kind of momentum and it gives you just a card to strengthen your hand in the negotiation. And this is what Abbas said, I'm going there, it's not the end of the process, but if the Israelis agree to our term, which is freezing settlement, 67 border, etc., we're willing to negotiate tomorrow. So the fact that they wanted to go to the UN, it wasn't just uh, because they realized that actually uh, when Abbas goes back that they're going to have something, and the Palestinians will say, well, we've got a state now. They know even probably the Israelis can stop Abbas from crossing the, uh, the from Jordan to, to Ramallah because they're in charge of everything. So I think the fact that they do it just to create some kind of uh, uh, dynamic on the ground, I think that was the motive behind it. I mean, and I agree, probably the Palestinians didn't think of a bigger strategy. What's going to happen when it fails? Who's going to be with them? Who's going to be against them? Uh, what's a long-term strategy five, year, five years from now? I don't think they actually reached that s stage yet. I think they're still on, let's take it one step further, and if we get the General Assembly and we get acceptance to the ICC, maybe, um, that will be something um, that they can use. Um, well, well, luckily, we haven't seen a five-year strategy from Washington either, so... It's not the Palestinians that are the only ones without a strategy. This is true. Uh, sorry, what was the third question? For in the US. Oh, yeah, no, I don't really see this changing. The narrative is very pro-Israel, no matter what, in America. It's going to take a long time, I will say decades, maybe 50 years, maybe, I don't know. I'm, I'm completely pessimistic when it comes to that. Um, it's not going to be pro-Palestinians. It's not even going to be pro-Israel peace as such that is the interest of the survival of the Jewish state dependent um, fundamentally on the fact that they have a Palestinian state. They don't see that. 
There is a movement and it's growing. It's not as strong as in Europe, but the Israelis use it to the maximum to show that this is, and they link it to anti-Israel, anti this government. And it becomes even now that in Washington, you cannot speak anti-Likud, no, let alone anti-Israel. It's really been framed from a right-wing point of view, as opposed even to the general interests of, of the Jewish state. So I, I don't really see this taking, uh, gathering any momentum anytime soon. All right. Uh, Yossi, do you want to comment on that? on process versus outcome, or? Uh, yes, I do. Um, why not call Abu Mazen's bluff at the UN by, by welcoming to say, well, uh, 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 one, one um, substantive, uh, one substantive opposition or, or doubt that is legitimate from the standpoint of an Israeli who backs away from this is that you, you, once you start internationalizing this conflict, it's a slippery slope and you don't know where it's going to end. And, uh, 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 but that Israel is, is, uh, is certainly, uh, has far less support internationally than the Palestinians do, whether it's at the UN or other bodies. Uh, uh, and leaving aside American public opinion, I agree with you on what you said. Um, and that, so that, therefore, we have to keep this uh, as, a, as uh, uh, direct bilateral negotiations with American involvement, in which, as you said earlier, uh, in, in the correct Palestinian view, Israel has the upper hand. Uh, so, I mean, this is an understandable uh, hesitance, hesit uh, source of hesitation. Secondly, uh, Netanyahu understands perfectly well uh, that if the UN does approve something, it, it will be generally understood to be, even if not specifically mentioned, to be along the 67 lines. And he doesn't accept the 67 lines. He simply doesn't. So this is another reason why he's going to oppose it. As for Obama, uh, uh, someone who has championed uh, uh, the international arena and, and engagement and so on and so forth, well, uh, obviously there are electoral considerations. Uh, in his uh, opposition, even going back to February in the settlement uh, uh, resolution. Um, uh, uh, um, but beyond that, uh, this administration has made just about every possible mistake uh, regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and one could list this as another one. Do you want me to look at the other? Let, let me just deal with the gentleman from the National sure. Democratic Institute. Um, how do you bring about a paradigm shift in the next uh, five years? Um, Look, the very fact that you asked the question pleases me because that's really what I want to leave you with is the notion that we need a paradigm shift and we have to, and even if you don't agree with my paradigm uh, and there's plenty of meat there not to agree with, I, I, I understand, but at least we have to start looking and stop being so hypocritically, uh, hypocritical advocates of pointless ne negotiations. Um, from the Israeli standpoint, to the extent that there is international and or Arab support for a new state-to-state -state paradigm, but a win-win one, not a one-sided one, a win-win one, uh, I would suggest that you will be giving the moderate Israeli public something to campaign on. As matters stand, the, the peace camp in Israel has been totally uh, delegitimized. Uh, uh, because it's advocating what we all agree is totally hypocritical and pointless, okay? Whether it's coming from Ashton or from Shelly uh, Yechimovich uh, uh, or uh, Yossi Sarid. Uh, it's a shrinking peace camp. You can't even find the leaders anymore. <laughs> but no, but, but there is such a camp. There are plenty of rational and moderate people. They're also represented by, by Kadima which Tsipi uh, Livni also is just, uh, again, advocating, you know, I almost reached an agreement with Abu Allah. If we could just <laughs> sit down again, we could do it. Give us something new. Give us something to point to uh, uh, and say, okay, here's a new idea. There's support for it out there. Uh, uh, and, and this is a, a much better way to address and attack the position of the existing government in Israel. Do you want to add to that? Ron? I got nothing to add. You got nothing. All right, let's take two more questions. Um, gentleman right here. Um, hello, my name is Mina. I am um, from Egypt, Egyptian Union of Liberal Youth. And uh, I'm coming from the new Egypt. 
Uh, my reading for New Egypt, actually, I'm not um, seeing any positive in, in the New Egypt. Um, right now, we have uh, like three uh, major topics on, on the public debate, which is the first one, the sectarian problem right now, and the, um, the economic and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, two months ago, there was an interview for two of the presidency candidates in, in Egypt, which is the first one, Hazim Salah Abu Ismail, the Islamic uh, candidate, and the second one is um, Hamdin Sabahi. And the question was how, well, when we should declare the war against Israel. Um, the debate now is more uh, far from any uh, rational or uh, uh, can I ask you to phrase it as a question, though? Sorry? Can, we, can I ask you to get towards your question? Yeah, first? yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Well, the thing is, I have a lot to share, but my question is, uh, are, what kind of strategy that uh, we are going to deal with the new Egypt and its role in the Arab-Israeli conflict? Okay, thanks. Uh, and we'll take Mark in the back. Yossi, we've seen in the West Bank uh, recently, a series of incidents uh, that have been going on for a while between settlers and, and Palestinians, and most recently, a series of follow-on incidents between settlers in the Israeli army. Uh, is it your assessment that these will escalate? How important are they? How closely is the Netanyahu government looking at it? Is it a, is it a cause for maybe moving the Netanyahu government in a way that they might not go before? So, Rob, do you want to talk about Egypt for a moment, and then we can turn to the... I, mean, I think even uh, implicit in the question was the other question, is it really a new Egypt? I, I, the one area where I think, and, you know, I think it was pretty obvious from the outset was once you have public opinion playing a bigger role in the making of public policy, then by definition, attitudes towards Israel and, the, and Egypt's policy towards, towards the uh, Israeli-Palestinian process, towards Gaza, will have to change to some extent, and over time I think it's going to change in a more pronounced way. I think Egypt will be more like Turkey than, more like Erdogan's Turkey than like Mubarak's uh, Egypt. Um, and that's a factor that I think everyone has to take into account. I don't think Egypt has an interest, certainly not the current leadership, in breaking ties with Israel and going to, let alone going to war and even questioning the Camp David Accords. But on issues that are going to resonate with their public, they're going to have to be careful not to be viewed as at odds with, 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 with overwhelming uh, sentiments. So I think that's, that's something that, but it's not just true of Egypt. I think it's going to be true, and already is true, uh, of, of most of the countries in the region. And that's, you know, one could argue, is this going to be detrimental because it means that it's going to be harder to make a deal, or more positive because it means that ultimately regimes are going to be more representative of their people. I tend towards the latter view. Great. And Yossi, can you address sort of where, where do things stand right now between settlers, IDF, and the West Bank? And yeah, just, just to uh, address the Egypt issue sure. from the Israeli standpoint, if I may, uh, with all of my uh, admiration for the new Egypt, we don't know how this is going to end. We don't know how this is going to end in a single Arab country that is undergoing revolution. And so it's extreme, and, and nor can we have any influence on it. Uh, so it's extremely difficult to devise strategies, other than what Rob said, that, you, that clearly public, uh, the street uh, has a totally new significance. But it's extremely difficult to devise strategies for dealing, from the Israeli standpoint, for dealing with this when we don't know how it's going to end and when it hasn't ended. What most concerns Israelis today is Sinai. Si the Sinai-Gaza uh, Negev uh, uh, complex uh, uh, but this is, these are tactical issues. These are not uh, so much strategic issues. Now, uh, Mark, you, uh, you, you talk about the price tag settlers, or the Hill Youth, the price tag settlers. Uh, look, this, it, it, I, I'm constantly fascinated by the capacity of the, uh, the old guard settler leadership to roll their eyes and say, you know, we don't know where these people came from. And, and uh, uh, we condemn what they do and so on and so forth, but we don't know who they are. Uh, I mean, this is the natural outcome of the settler movement. Second or third generation, the fourth generation could be worse. Uh, now, the Israeli security establishment is gradually taking this more seriously to the extent that it's already labeled this 
an underground and uh, labeled some of it terrorism. Uh, 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 but they really, they really haven't been able to put their hands on these guys because the, set, the settler infrastructure in the West Bank is, feels far more at home there than the IDF does. And of course, uh, 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 there's, there are clear rules of the game whereby Palestinian security uh, uh, organizations don't touch this issue and, and don't, uh, and don't uh, deal with them. Um, I would suggest that if and, if and when, well, I mean, what are we seeing here? We're seeing the extreme end of the ideological settler movement, uh, which is, is, is setting, trying to set limits on what the Israeli government can do and in effect create, establish itself almost as a separate, as a separate political or a separate uh, functioning entity in the West Bank and taking steps aimed at uh, making life uh, increasingly unpleasant for Palestinians in the hopes that they will go away. Uh, where this is going to lead, I don't know. If there is any agreement, if and when there's an agreement on removing settlements, what we see here is a clear indication that uh, there will be bloodshed between Israelis. Okay? This is a clear indication. And it's frightening enough that I can even imagine a situation in which, again, in this hypothetical situation where we're actually, we've actually reached some sort of agreement and we're evacuating settlements, I, 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 I can see a, imagine a situation in which Israel says either to these guys in these uh, hilltop settlements, uh, we're not going to mess with you. We'll leave you for the Palestinians to deal with, which is extremely dangerous and, and, and volatile. Or I can imagine, and uh, when I talk to my fellow ex-security uh, uh, officials and mention this, they're horrified, but I can imagine a situation where Israel welcomes an international force to help it get rid of these people and thereby reduce the dangers of not civil war, but of strife uh, between Israelis. That's how far this has come. And as matters stand with this government, and with the total lack of a peace process or prospects for a peace process, this is going to get worse. Well, there you have it. Um, <laughs> that's what to keep your eyes on. I want to thank everyone so much for coming on this rainy morning. Um, I want to thank our, our distinguished panelists, Yossi Alpha, Rob Malley, and Nadia Bilbasi, and to New America, to my colleagues Tom Kutch and Stephanie Gunther. So thank you. We'll see you next time. Could this be